Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the James Madison edition of the Irk Russell Show, a team that has really given us uh, all we could handle for the last two years, uh, Coach, and it looks like they, <laughs> today might be no different. They come to town fully equipped to give us nothing but trouble, Bill. They really dress out as one of the finest squads that we play. They've got a fine scheme of offense, and they play defense really well. And if we're going to win the game today, we're going to have to play the best game that we've ever played. And we can't afford to turn the ball over to them. And we've got to get some turnovers from them. So in a nutshell, that's about the way it shapes up. In fact, that's the way basically it shaped up last year. We had a, had a lucky break on a touchdown that was theirs. It was called back. We got a fumble on the goal line, and things turned around for us. Um, and this week, we've got to avoid the mistakes we made early last week. Absolutely. Uh, their coaching staff, since they flew, had to cut down on the number of uh, people that they brought. I don't think they brought but about 75. <laughs> and uh, one of their coaches suggested that they just leave their punter at home since they didn't use him last year. <laughs> I certainly hope that uh, they have have to use their punter once or twice, but as you know, last year they didn't. <laughs> Did they, they didn't mess with Eagle Creek as we do. Uh, I just talked with Coach uh, Perzicki out there, and he said they made it a point not to not <laughs> to do anything <laughs> purple with beautiful Eagle Creek. <laughs> what uh, now? You've seen these guys, I believe Appalachian State uh, beat them. Did have you seen the films on that? What was it that Appalachian State did that maybe we'd be able to capitalize on? Well, we didn't get that film in our film exchange. We only go back three games. But uh, as you know, Appalachian is, is ranked number two in the country. They have an experienced team and a very good one. And uh, I believe they beat uh, James Madison 17 to 10, uh, which is not a bad score since they played at Appalachian. And uh, you can bet your life that uh, since that game, I believe they've won six in a row. And uh, they're every bit as good as their record indicates. I think training-wise, we're in a little better shape this week. Is that right? Well, our offensive line continues to heal. Uh, Warnock and Tony Smith are in better shape than they've been in a long time. And uh, we don't have anybody uh, who is going to miss or play less because of injuries uh, from last week's game or injuries sustained in practice this week. So we're in as good a shape as we could possibly be uh, from an injury standpoint. Well, let's get after them. Oh, I hope we can because we've got to, and I'll see you later. <laughs> okay, and we'll see you with the first half. It seems everyone had their own personal way of getting fired up for the Georgia Southern James Madison clash at homecoming yesterday, but why would one get his hair carved and sculptured for the occasion? Student Mike Holsamak had the perfect answer. Trying to get the fans fired up for the big game. Notice we've been kind of quiet the past few weeks, so I had to get everybody going. Did this fire him up? Sure did. <laughs> Well, that was obvious, but yesterday's final score belies just how close this contest was until the fourth quarter explosion. It was obvious that James Madison wanted to ruin the Eagles' homecoming festivities. But Georgia Southern had other ideas, starting with Nay Young's 19-yard kickoff return to get the Eagles' first scoring drive started at their own 26-yard line. Things got off to a fast start when Raymond Gross pitched to Joe Ross, who had to stretch for it, but the second and five play netted 10 yards when it was over. Gross then passed GSC into James Madison territory with a 12-yard strike to Herman Barron that got us to the enemy 42. Then the Eagles survived a scare when Gross threw to all-too-well-covered Tony Belzer at the goal line on this play, and about 15,000 folks breathed a collective sigh of relief when the defender couldn't hold on. It was a different story on the ensuing play, however, a trip to Touchdown City, courtesy of travel agent Frank Johnson. It seems that we're getting to jail, and really this is the time of year for us to jail, you know. It's late in the season, it's getting about playoff time, and, you know, the defense has played good all year, and the offense is starting, you know, to get their stuff together, and really, you know, we're starting to come together as a team, and, you know, this is the time that we need it. With the addition of Raymond, you know, he, he kind of opens up things for everybody, you know. He, he can make things happen. He can make things happen on the perimeter, which is where we've been lacking at. You know, they've been taking the fullback and, you know, the quarterback, and that's really what we need somebody to make things happen for us, and Raymond has really helped us out a lot. You feel comfortable, Frank, this year? How's your, how's your foot healed? Is it okay? Yeah, it's coming along slowly, but yeah, I think this week off is going to help it out a whole lot. You know, it's, it's hindering me from making my cut mm -hmm. when, I, when I need to make them, and uh, with this week off, I think I can, you know, get over it and be ready by the time, you know, in stretch of the season. For the past two years, Georgia Southern's battle cry has been just one more time. But for the past two months, the new battle cry has been make the play. And they have taken that one to heart as well. But after a 29-yard kickoff return up at the 41, there was cause for concern. 
fullback Greg Medley's nine-yard zone off right tackle to the Southern 38 didn't help ease matters, but Savannah's Nay Young did. Young, whose exploits in the secondary have become synonymous with big plays, made another, picking off an Eric Green pass. So at another crucial and timely interception to Nay Young's repertoire as the quarter ended 7-0 Eagles. Once again Saturday with a super homecoming crowd of nearly 17,000 watching, the largest ever, thank you, the Eagles made the big play when they had to. Just when it seemed things were going James Madison's way, like Eric Green's 22-yard pass to Neil Wilkinson down to the 23, on second and nine, the Dukes made progress backwards. Watch David Hodge fight off Neil Wilkinson's block and drop Greg Medley for a three-yard loss. And by the time reinforcements had arrived, Hodge had the situation and Medley well in hand. It forced the Dukes to go for a field goal two plays later, and that was nothing for JMU to wire home about either. Tim Garrity's 41-yard attempt sailed harmlessly to the left and was woefully short. But the Dukes would live to fight again. Forced to punt, freshman Terry Harbin out of Keystone Heights, Florida, got off a dandy Southern fans hoped would go out on the one, but it hit the pylon instead. Automatic touchback, and back came the Dukes. On their second possession after that Harbin punt, JMU set sail for the end zone. Green pitching to pesky Rodney Stockett, who gave us trouble all afternoon. He's the one in the combat boots. 17 yards here down to the GSC 27. Three plays later it happened. Long and tall Neil Wilkinson out jumped Taz Dixon at the corner on a beautiful 17 yard touchdown pass and we were tied 7 all. But the Raymond Gross led Eagles came soaring right back. Gross calling his own number for six yards and into JMU territory on this play. And with 22 seconds to go in the half Tim Foley booted the Eagles into the lead for good. A 38-yard field goal to make it 10-7 at intermission. And we'll be back to talk with Rick Mandees about homecoming 87 right after this. James Madison came out of the locker room like there was no tomorrow, vacuuming up yardage like a high-powered Hoover. After a pass to Neil Wilkinson for 14 yards, Eric Green hit Leon Taylor streaking down the sidelines for 21 more down to the Southern 42. And moments later, the Green Air Show got the Dukes first and goal at the two-yard line on a 36-yard flight to our nemesis in combat boots, Rodney Stockett, taunting the crowd and endearing him to Georgia Southern fans forever. But Mr. Stockett would have the defense to him socket shortly. Uh, for the second week in a row, the Eagle defense put on their impression of the Internal Revenue Service, where there's no escape, starting with defensive guard Charlie Waller tossing Tony Grady for a yard loss. On second down, Green tried to pass to Stockett in the end zone, but it was shamefully too low. How very unfortunate. On third down, Mr. Green met Big Blue, an eagle blitz that had poor Eric so desperate to find a receiver, he actually imagined one on the sidelines. Sorry, Eric, photographers don't count. Intentional grounding was the call. But instead of going for a tie, JMU decided to risk it on fourth and goal from the 32. But Oliver Davis would have none of that batting it away in the end zone, and the Dukes' threat was over momentarily. After another GSC punt, just like Western Kentucky last week, it was hold on, Eagle fans, here they come again. Tony Grady, who seemed hemmed in, cut back against the grain and got to the Southern 14. But on the ensuing play, Green went for that deadly corner to long, tall Neil Wilkinson. Only this time, equally long, tall 6'3", Randall Boone made an outstanding leaping interception. So much for that threat, as the GSC bomb squad came trotting off the field, averting yet another explosion. Late in the third period, it was time for the play to fire us up. The Eagle Express bogged down at midfield, and everyone seemed to sense what was to come. We knew Yogi could do it if given the chance while he was hot. So Irk and company made the decision. Go for it. A 63-yard field goal that was not only the longest for Tim and Paulson Stadium, but the longest in Division I AA history. Just another day at the office for Mr. Foley. Right, Irk? Our kicking game was super. I was just uh, delighted to see Yogi uh, make a record field goal. It's a very good way for a coach to get fired and run out of town by <laughs> kicking a field goal in a situation like that. And it really was not the percentage thing for us to do. But today was our day and things were going right. And sometimes you can violate all the principles of good strategic football and come out ahead and ain't it great <laughs> he felt like he could make it i felt like he could make it our center stan stipe for some reason told me that he was going to make it and i don't know what he knows about it but he's seen him kick ten thousand times so he knows what he's talking about 
Yeah, I was fortunate. I'm just glad Coach Russell gave me the opportunity to kick it. Uh, not many coaches would do that, and uh, I'm glad he has enough faith in me to to kick it that far. And uh, I figured if he has that much faith, you know, I better do my part of it too. I might not get another chance at it. So uh, I just kicked it the best I could, and I was fortunate enough and went through. But you knew when you hit it, it was good. It felt good when I hit it, and I looked up, and uh, I just I couldn't really see it go through, but uh, everybody kind of jumped on me, so I figured I made it. Normally, a 13-7 to lead going to the final period is not a comfortable cushion, except for the circumstances. JMU by now was completely demoralized, and the Eagles then put down the Dukes, adding a pair of fourth-quarter scores. Joe Ross nearly broke for it on this play, a 47-yard gain that got him down to the JMU 9 and first and goal for Georgia Southern. And on fourth and goal, Ernest Thompson hurtled his way home for a 19-7 GSC advantage. And with less than four minutes to go, the Eagles began driving again, driving the final nail in the Duke's coffin. Raymond Gross rolled out to his left here and got GSC down to the five. And on the ensuing play, Ernest Thompson carried the mail again and went through a hole that resembled I-16 into the promised land. 26-7, Georgia Southern, and the defense took it from there. Right, Wild Man? The defense line are the commanders, Coach Pate's commandos. <laughs> and then we, we, can, we grow our camouflage and we get kind of crazy. And all of us, we, we all got shirts and we all wear them. And, and now the whole team's wearing camouflage. I mean, everybody's got a piece of camouflage. And it's been working this past three weeks, so we're going to keep wearing it. I am. And Urkel have final comments in a moment. James Madison game in the history books. I know you're not only glad to have this one over, Coach, but if there was ever a time when everything came together properly today and you had a comfortable lead at the end, uh, today was the day. Bill, it's, it was really good with um, four minutes, five minutes left when Yogi kicked that final field goal and put us ahead 15, and then I had to make a decision to take those points off the ball and, and try to take some time off the clock, and then we scored. We felt like from that point on, it's the first time in the fourth quarter that I can remember this year, except for the first game, uh, being able to relax a little bit. Our guys, every one of them, carried out his responsibility with maximum effort. And we've always maintained that if we can get that kind of effort, good things are going to happen for us. And sure enough, good things happened for Georgia Southern today. And uh, the mistakes were kept at a minimum. We had one exchange between the center and the quarterback, and I believe that was our center's fault. And I think that's a 100% that's a improvement right there. Uh, we made big third down plays on offense, and we made third down plays on defense, and except for a, a punt return and a kickoff return that got loose, our kicking game was super. Now, you've got a week off to kind of lick your wounds and get ready for South Carolina State. I know you don't particularly like a week off, but you might need it this time. Well, we've got some bruises that need to heal. Um, we're going to run a little bit and lift some weights Monday and Tuesday and then practice Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Um, as I told the guys after the game, this is the third week in a row that we were dying. <laughs> and a good-looking woman came by and gave us mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation <laughs> and brought us back to life. And that's all we are now. They just uh, We've been brought back to, to life again. We've got another chance to play another game just one more time. And ain't it great? Ain't it great. We'll yep. see you next week, Coach. Thanks. Okay, and we'll see you next week as well. That's the Eric Russell Show for this week, and we appreciate you joining us. We'll see you again next week when we'll have a special edition.